Hey everyone and welcome to ILS Concepts for Electronics Technicians. This is the first lesson called ILS Overview. The ILS is comprised of a localizer, glide slope, and a combination of marker beacons. ILS signals are measured and evaluated at two places by ILS technicians. The transmitter, which is located in a small building near each antenna, and the far field, which are established points on the ground at some distance away from these antennas. Airborne measurements are also made periodically by a specially equipped aircraft known as flight inspection for the most accurate analysis of these signals. The localizer provides the horizontal guidance and also broadcasts a four letter ILS Morse code station identity, which always begins with the letter I. As the aircraft's distance increases from runway centerline, so does the amount of needle deflection on the course deviation indicator, known as the CDI. The glide slope portion of the ILS provides the vertical guidance, or glide path, up to 10 nautical miles out. The CDI responds accordingly to bring the pilot back to the glide path. Together, the localizer and glide slope funnel in aircraft in what is considered to be a precision approach. To be considered precision, it must have the glide slope component. The ILS is used for limited or reduced visibility to, safe, to satisfy instrument flight rule or IFR regulation requirements. The ILS marker beacons provide a pilot, when on final approach, a series of visual and audio indications in order to determine their location along the ILS approach, such as a final approach fix or decision height. They operate at 75 megahertz and are modulated by the various audio tones shown. From the runway threshold, the outer marker is located four to seven nautical miles away. The middle marker is at a distance of 3,000 to 6,000 feet, while the inner marker is approximately 200 feet from runway threshold. By effects of the antenna array that we will later discuss, a predominance of 90 and or 150 hertz will result depending on where you are receiving the ILS signal. The 90 hertz signal drives the CDI needle telling the pilot to fly right to align the aircraft with runway centerline, while the 150 hertz signal drives the needle to tell the pilot to fly left. In other words, the pilot chases the needle to find centerline. When equal amounts of 90 and 150 hertz are received, you are properly aligned with the center line. At threshold, full-scale deflection of the CDI should occur at 350 feet either side of runway center line for a total width of 700 feet. This is known as the tailored course width, since the localizer width in degrees is dependent upon runway length. For example, Using the inverse tangent function, we can estimate the half-width angle of a 10,000-foot runway by dividing 350 feet over 10,000 feet, which equals 2 degrees. Multiply that by 2, and we know a 10,000-foot runway should have a 4-degree total airborne width. However, specially equipped aircraft, known as flight inspection, are used to establish this tailored airborne width. Note that the airborne width should also be correlated by the ILS technician on the ground to a checkpoint called the course edge or half width point. In the glide slope, the 90 hertz is the fly down signal to align the pilot with the proper glide path angle. Conversely, the 150 hertz audio tone tells the pilot to fly up to intercept the glide path. When equal amounts of 90 and 150 hertz audio tone are received, you are properly aligned with the glide path. All glide slopes have a width of 1.4 degrees. The glide path angle of 3 degrees is most typical with a threshold crossing height of around 55 feet plus or minus 5. These parameters can only be directly verified by specially equipped aircraft known as flight inspection due to the altitudes and distances to which they occur. The standard service volume or SSV is the volume of airspace defined by the national standard. Here we can see the two sectors associated with the localizer that must provide acceptable guidance. Sector 1 is 10 to 10 degrees either side of center line at a distance of 18 nautical miles. Sector 2 provides coverage from 35 to 35 degrees either side of center line at a distance of 10 nautical miles. While the glide slope provides vertical guidance, there are certain horizontal areas of coverage that it must provide vertical guidance in which as we can see is eight degrees either side of runway center line. 
In the vertical plane, the glide slope must provide guidance information down to 0.45 degrees above ground and 1.75 degrees above the commissioned angle. Before we begin a discussion on ILS categories, we must define two terms. The first is the decision height, or DH, which is the lowest altitude in the approach descent where a pilot must initiate a missed approach if certain runway visual cues are not visible to the pilot. And the runway visual range, or RVR, which is the distance a pilot would see when on the runway centerline and is determined by equipment located next to the runway. Each of the following categories also requires increasing amounts of airfield lighting to meet the operational category. Category 1 provides an approach to a height above touchdown of not less than 200 feet and a runway visual range of not less than 1,800 feet. Category 2 provides an approach to a height above touchdown of not less than 100 feet and a runway visual range of not less than 1,200 feet. Category 3 provides approaches to a height above touchdown with the following RVRs. Category 3A, less than 100 feet decision height with a runway visual range of not less than 700 feet. Category 3B, less than 50 feet decision height with a runway visual range of not less than 150 feet. And Category 3C, with no decision height requirements and no RVR minimums. Each category of operation has certain tolerances that must be met, especially during flight inspection. As an ILS technician, it's important that you understand these categories and how they apply to maintenance tolerances of your system. This includes lesson one of ILS concepts, ILS overview. In the next lesson, we'll discuss the ILS signals.